Good morning. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce our plenary speaker, Edwin Anderson. Um, Edwin grew up here in North Carolina in Winston-Salem. He attended NCSSM and he took a math modeling course with Dan Teague. And in Edwin's word, words, that experience changed his life. Um, his teaching has been a big part of his, his career and his life. Um, after graduating from NCSSM in 1989, he earned mathematics and physics degrees at NC State. There he served as a teaching assistant for the physics department for three of his four years and worked as a tutor for dyslexic students through student services. He went on to earn his PhD in physics at Cornell, where he also taught as a graduate student and was on the faculty for two years. His careers have taken him in lots of different places. Um, in particular, math modeling has played a big role in his um, careers. He's currently a partner at the international consulting firm Oliver Wyman, where he has remained involved in financial modeling, including not only mortgages, but also climate change with the United Nations, and on housing challenges in foreign countries. We're very excited that he's here with us today. And please welcome to, uh, Edwin Anderson as he talks about the razor in the bubble. So uh, a couple of comments. The first is one of the kind of basics of any presentation is pictures, diagrams, pictures. One of the basics of the business world is you don't own it, you can't take it with you, you can't show it to anybody. Yeah. So there are many things in here in which I have seen the Google pictures and they are still the drive of some previous company I worked for. And as much as I would like to buy a half million dollar data set and do nine months of work to show you the pretty picture, I can't. But I'll just start with, this is a known pedagogical weakness. So I want to do a little bit of in media res for this story. Take you back to September 15th, 2008. Subprime mortgage market had collapsed along with associated bonds. CDO bond market had collapsed. Lehman had failed. Bear Stearns had failed. And I was sitting with my team with the weird experience that this is pretty much exactly the list of events that we had predicted. As so much crumbled, it was a really weird, weird experience. We'd actually made money in the business world a lot but not gobs, and everyone else was losing gobs. We'd done that while telling all of our clients, sell your subprime mortgage bonds, sell your CDO bonds, and through a role of interacting with senior leaders at companies, we knew essentially no one was prepared. A central banker had mocked me by pointing out some basic bits of standard economic theory that showed that subprime bonds could never collapse. For what it's worth, economics does not come out well in this talk. Microeconomics, behavioral economics, fabulous. Macroeconomics, mostly garbage. What was actually a little darker is within a few days of all this, the merger with Merrill Lynch meant that basically we were all going to be fired. So it was a little strange. An important caveat to all of this. This is a story about, that's fundamentally about success in mathematical modeling and some of the things that led to it. So it'd be easy for that to come across as a bit boastful. So I think it's an incredibly important caveat. I have had an enormous amount of luck and privilege. I have been in the right place, in the right time, and happened to know the right people at some kind of crazy points. The Lehman Brothers thing came because I went to a conference on a lark and a Lehman Brothers guy who probably shouldn't have explained one of their strategies to a group of people that he didn't expect one of their competitors to be in the audience. Okay, just weird stuff and better than fair hit rates. Uh, you expect on big financial predictions that if you get one in three, you're doing well. And we went through a period of about four years where we made zero mistakes. That's not fair. That's like flipping heads eight times in a row. Better than, better than we deserved. I have had every privilege except money, basically. I, white, straight, cis male, from a stable family that valued education, from a safe neighborhood with some unusual neighbors, 
an ex exceptional teachers and opportunities. When I say unusual neighbors, the guy behind me, who his dad, uh, worked on computers in the early 70s, and he had built his own mainframe in the basement. Just himself, and it was apparently like the third one. He would build them, rip them down, build them, but it meant that when I was three years old, I remember having a large Unix system to play with. All this a huge advantage, and then we have to recognize selection bias, right? If all of this had sure still crumbled into failure, the odds I'd be standing here as your speaker this morning, much lower, unless I was giving an object lesson in failure. <laughs> I won't claim I haven't worked hard, but as we all know, that's rarely enough. Today, I'm gonna to try and link some, a critical moment in my career and some of the learnings that have followed from it to the mathematics I've learned. And I'm really gonna concentrate on some things I've learned about the nature of problem solving and assumptions. It's not gonna be about a mathematical technique, but about that structure. It's probably clear the bubble for my title is the Great Recession. And a lot of the key mathematical ideas are entwined with the Razor title, Occam's Razor. And now, because I know at least some of you are thinking this, they're going, why did he misspell Occam? So Occam is the name of a town in England. It's an English word, but it got Latinized by people writing in Latin about this guy's writings later. And they changed the spelling. Yet somehow, when we reverse it back to English, most people leave the spelling, the Latin one, not the English one, even though they've gone back to English. That's weird. So, I'm gonna try and show you how some of the basic good ideas I learned about math modeling about 30 years ago within these walls, and there are gonna be some side trips. Another comment, I could lay out a deeply, carefully structured presentation, and that is the second most effective way to communicate. The most effective way to communicate, studies show, is through character-driven narratives that hang in people's minds. So if I err too far in that direction, please excuse me. I'm hoping that some of the pieces of this hang with you because I want you to learn what I learned and hopefully it can color and help your students. So I'm gonna first talk a little bit about Occam's razor. Then most of the talk's gonna be in two sections about bubbles. First, some basic, uh, some the two big problems we'll hit on is they had very poor numerical and structural footings, the models used, and then just a rethink of how academia approached it, and then some closing thoughts. Occam's razor. So there's that dichotomy, what was taught and what was learned. And I'm gonna, again, another important caveat, none of this has been checked with Dan Teague. He may hear this and go, oh my goodness, like is this, what was he remembering here? And actually, um, I, I live in a New York apartment, so there's, of course, not room for the four enormous tubs of all my academic materials. They are in my brother's garage in Washington, D.C. So even though I have carefully kept, and now it's in a blue binding with a white label on the front, um, my old notebook from, from uh, Dan Teague's class, I couldn't, go, I couldn't get my hands on it before today. So what do I remember? We weren't lectured to that much. We spent a lot of time doing in the class. And we spent a lot of time solving problems in groups. I remember voting power, which I think you've spoken on at this conference in recent years. Auction systems, spreads of diseases, Suez Canal usage optimization, forestry and tree growth, predator prey models, and more. I remember enjoying it, and I remember being engaged because of the amount of doing. Now, I certainly remember that enjoyment of doing these things, but what did I actually learn? I came out of it with a process, and I don't know how explicitly any pieces of this process were taught to me, because I can't look back at my notebooks, but when I started trying to teach some of my employees and students through the years, I found myself putting it in a framework. What's the real question? How can I get an initial answer making the best set of assumptions possible? And I'll touch on best as we go forward. How can I improve this answer through relaxing my assumptions or additional data? How trustworthy is my answer? And what are the implications? And again, I'll focus mostly on the two about assumptions. And I want to comment a little about what is the real question. 
I'm amazed how often this one is really wrong. So there's a case that's from the military. And a friend of mine was a modeler for the Army before he came in and worked for me in, in economics. So the military asked its modelers, could you predict when terrorist attacks in Baghdad are going to happen? Can you help us predict that? And they worked really hard on it. And they said, look, you know, it's not working. Which in the end, you kind of know it can't work, right? Because if it was predictable, then the attackers could essentially psych out their own patterns. There's a human feedback. It's essentially doomed to be an at least pseudo chaotic system. And at about the point that everyone was getting angry with each other, it was kind of revealed that they, everybody knew that it was dumb to ask when the attacks happened. That was a stupid question. But the question that they actually had was, even if they weren't posing it well, how do we prepare ourselves? And that meant understanding the clustering of attacks. How many medical response teams do we need? How many military response teams do we need? What kind of distribution of those might make sense? And in the end, that problem, the model answered well. What are the implications of my answer was the one I took the longest really to fully see it. I would think in terms of the implications in terms of, oh, how does this change how people should do things? As time's gone on, seeing the political and organizational implications um, has become clear how incredibly important it is and how those dysfunctions can feed back. One of the other things I learned from that class was a deeper understanding and appreciation for math in the world. I already liked math. There's no question of that. I had many good teachers. I enjoyed what I did. Another comment about those steps. You essentially almost never see all these steps done well. And occasionally, they are truly critically mangled. Um, another classic business world one, senior executive asks question. No one dares go back and clarify. Ask the senior executive what they mean. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go talk to Mary Ann. Actual, actual very senior executive that's come up in the last month. I don't want to ask Marianne what her question meant. I'm terrified of that. Well, so how does this fit in with Occam's razor? It's an old idea. Occam, great marketing move here, because the idea was 1,500 years old when he wrote about it. It goes all the way back to Aristotle. And it was basically that simpler explanations are better than more complicated ones. What does it really mean? People have written volumes. I'm not even going to scratch the surface in most ways. But let's talk about it in terms of math modeling. Solutions are best when they're most consistent with the trustworthy data and require fewer strong assumptions. And I'll clarify, trustworthy data is nuanced. Most data has not just random noisy errors, which everyone learns how to deal with, how to measure, how to understand, how to do those basic equations for standard error, and can look up in the internet techniques for doing fancier stuff. But most stuff has systemic, messy errors in it. Strong assumptions. And I mean this, there are a lot of ways you could define this technically. But very loosely, strong assumptions are ones that greatly affect the final answer. They box in where the solution is headed. You want to have fewer of those. It's often abused. Two are particularly insidious and common. The first is people pick the easy answer the one that involves them having to do the least work. It's usually easy to spot, but it's sometimes hard to fight when time and resources are limited. And sometimes it's your only option because your resources are limited, but often that's not why it's happening. The scary one is the least additional assumptions. What do I mean by that? So say you're an economics modeler, and you're looking at bunch of securities, and you're like, oh, there are rating agencies who tell me how good these are. I'll build a model that inputs rating agencies' data and comes up with an answer. Well, you've made very few assumptions. You can probably make a really tight, great set of assumptions. But you have just built on top of everything the rating agency assumed. And you know what? You've, you've built on to many, many assumptions. And for what it's worth, that example I just gave is how a lot of people got the financial crisis wrong. They used rating agencies and economists' models without going all the way back to the basic data. 
It's most common in academic disciplines, and I'm gonna tell you a fairly tragic story later about that, and in established businesses. We've always done it this way, this formula has always worked, why would we ever think back at this formula or look at the original data? So, the key idea that I learned through high school math was really, I think, about thinking about my process and in particular assumptions. And I think that they line up well with kind of the prudent use of Occam's razor. They rarely applied well, and I'm gonna talk you through how big these implications can be. So let's talk about bubbles. So let's back up a little bit from my earlier snapshot. In 2002, I'm looking for a new job. After I'd been a PhD at Cornell, I looked at what it meant to be a lecturer. I, I loved real world problems, didn't really like academic problem solving, and I was like, okay, I kind of see the game with a lecture when I watched a lecturer with 15 years of experience, every teaching award at the university, be told, well, there's a visiting adjunct professor who I'd met and could not actually speak the English language coherently. And guess what? Enrollment is down 2%, so we think we're gonna fire you. That was a wake up call. I'd spent two years at McKinsey going through their MBA program, and I can touch on later, it's another big management consulting firm, but what I would say is that they are masters of communication over substance, and even though I learned some substance there, the most important thing I learned there was about packaging things up, and it had given me, I, I think it's safe to say, a little bit of a cynical view on some things in the business world. I had an offer from the think tank RAND, it was a joint appointment to do education and economics work. And I'm like, this sounds like a lot of fun. I think I'm gonna go do this. And I told them, I've got a couple more interviews to do, but I'm probably gonna come join. A friend of mine asked me to interview at Bank of America. At the time, I lived in Charlotte. And I was like, I don't wanna be an investment banker. He's like, one hour. Just give them one hour. It's like, okay, they have one hour. And you know, what's an hour? As a favor to a friend. So I sat down with a department head. He was a youngish Duke math PhD who actually just by happenstance, I saw this past week, uh, uh, a fascinating breakfast with Sherrod. Um, and he showed me how two models worked. One for residential mortgages, so single family homes, condos, and one for commercial mortgages, office buildings, apartments, places where a landlord owns a building and collects rent. He asked me, what do you think of these? Well, in consulting, there's a very standard type of interview. And in that interview, it's called a case interview. They give you a question, you tell them what you think, and show your skills by digging in. And I'm like, this looks exciting. So I quickly took apart the residential model. I'm like, look, it's massively overfit for the following reasons. It's gonna look pretty on back tests, but there's no way it's gonna work. Basically, the, whole, the core problem was the following. Imagine that I have 10,000 phenomena that all follow the same sine curve. How many degrees of freedom do I have? Well, a sine curve has an amplitude, a phase, and a frequency, so three, but I got 10,000 things doing this. Do I have 30,000, do I have three? Well, if they're moving pretty much in lockstep, you have three. And these folks were acting like they had hundreds of thousands of degrees of freedom. And they were fitting 20 variables to it, and they maybe had eight. The commercial model was beautiful. It was so, as, as a person trained in physics, it was so graceful and beautiful. But also, I remember things, some of them explicitly from Dan's class, and about some of the chaotic systems we saw. And I was like, this thing's chaotic. It's gonna be like a random number generator any meaningful time in the future. And I'm like, so I took apart your two models. I was feeling good. And then it turns out this wasn't a case interview question. These were the standard models for mortgages. Um, my jaw dropped, I looked at them incredulously, and I was like, so everybody's using these? And I, I tried to think of why. Because normally the assumption that people are being stupid is you not seeing them, you not putting yourself in their shoes. So I assumed I had to be missing something. I'm like, oh, is there a gross shortage of data? Were they forced to this by the fact? And then he showed me the volumes of data available. And I was like, uh, if I come work here, can I do something radically different? It was like walking into an academic discipline and discovering that everything people had done previously was using crayon on walls. And you're like, and here's a stack of data. Would you like to start a whole new field? It was kind of crazy. And thus, seven years of my life started. 
Um, why were the models so bad? Don't we have a whole field of economics studying this? Whole enterprises? The heart of these models were for academic institutions. We're gonna go to this. Additional life lesson, if you park in a two hour space and you end up staying for eight plus hours, you can accumulate a lot of expensive parking tickets, especially when you're currently unemployed. <laughs> a gross simplification of what was wrong. There are a couple of big things that kind of drive, drove the crisis, and for that matter, sadly, some of the modelers. People were being paid to act in ways that encouraged them to ignore problems and wreck the economy. Sadly, this is largely still the case, and it's well outside the scope of this talk. But in the modeling way, the academic grounding was terrible. There were numerical structures that made doing it right very, very difficult, and the study of economic bubbles was, and mostly still is, an unmitigated disaster. Things are better now, but the pressure to do poor economic modeling remains enormous. Poor numerical footings. So we're going to take a vote here. How would you think about the economy? Would you think about it as each industry having its own ups and downs and some correlations between them you might measure that lead up to booms and crises? Or the economy moves up and down en masse and there are variations where an economy might do, uh, industry might do better or worse. So how many people want to vote for the first one? Two, three, four, uh, a handful. How many people want to vote for the second? Okay, most of the room. So, though some people do pick the first answer, most people pick the latter. The latter is certainly the simpler way to think. Turns out that, from a mathematical point of view, they're identical. And the first one allows you to let every modeler build their own specific model for the individual disciplines and use a correlation structure to link them so it's politically easier, chosen by both modeling groups. But in a way, if you think about it, one of them sounds like an oversimplification. We're choosing the easy route. The other, we're letting all these modelers do their own thing and then putting something on top of it. So we're building up a lot of assumptions on top of assumptions. So that sounds like the other error. So you know, you'd build the distribution, set up the relationship, and add them up to understand it. There's a dominant form that I'm not going to get technical in this talk on, called Gaussian cupolas. It was the standard academic approach. And in fact, there was math, like Sklar's theorem, that showed that it's identical. All you had to do is get the distributions and the cupolas correct, and you were fine. But it didn't work. The results were, I think if you compared them to actual history, kind of silly, in fact. How did it go wrong? Well, the correlation structure necessary to make the answers identical was really complicated. It was so complicated that people essentially threw up their hands and said, let's just measure historical ones. We'll say uh, the correlation between income and forestry and changes in income and corn farming is uh, 0.6. We looked at it historically, 0.6. The problem is the actual correlation structure was a complex function. Who is gonna figure out thousands of complex functions? It wasn't even doable, fill in 0.6 problem with that, there's a mathematical nugget that's often talked about in modelers, which is that it, all correlations go to one in a crisis. So having all of them said at point three, actually essentially, and point six, actually did not allow crises to happen in the models. It was impossible. So isn't the alternative to oversimplify? Well, the test was to look at the data. And it turns out that the simple approach one big curve for the economy, perturbations, fits phenomenally better. You're actually not giving up much by taking that. And when you relax the assumption and allow the variations by industry to more, be more complicated, turns out it works pretty well. So the simpler model was more robust to its changes in assumptions, partially just because there were fewer complex ones built on. I want to tell a side trip here. And it is a piece of tragedy, I would say. So it was about 2004. I don't have the records to be certain of the year. And I was doing a job interview with a student who was about to finish their PhD in economics. It was an Ivy League school, and it was one of the saddest moments of my career. Student's reaction, I mean, it's still solid in my mind. And the reason I'm telling this story is because this student had gotten themselves in a place you never want any of your students to get into. To make this make sense, I'm actually gonna have to talk about the assumptions behind a bit of commercial real estate theory. And so we're gonna take 
a detour off our detour. So there's an idea theory called double trigger default, which you can write in two different logically equivalent forms. One says a borrower will not default on their mortgage on a commercial building, so building where they collect rents, if the rent is greater than their expenses plus paying the mortgage. That makes sense, right? If I'm getting a check each month, why am I defaulting on this building? And even if they're not making money, as long as the mortgage is less than what the property can be sold for, I'm going to hang on to it and at least try and sell it to unlock the difference. Does that make sense to folks? These are pretty common sense rules. You, you'd like to have a check, and if you have a thing, even if it's losing you a little bit of money each month, if you can sell it quickly and make enough money, you'd also hang on to it. Well, that's logically equivalent to saying they will default if the rent is less and the mortgage is greater. I partially did this just to have fun with basic logic, but also the one on the left is the one that usually fits people's common sense better. The one on the right is actually how it's applied normally and structurally in models. It's a pair of common sense triggers. What could go wrong? Let's do a thought experiment. Imagine you're the property owner. You've got the nice building in your commercial district. It's worth 100 bucks, which is more than the 70 bucks most of the other buildings are. And why is that? Because you've got a really nice restaurant. And everyone's like, you have got the best tenant. They've got a good, solid income. They send you a big check. It's really great. You make seven bucks a year at $12 in rent minus a buck of expenses. Most of the time, tenants pay most expenses, but there's some you're probably having to pay to mow the lawn, and maybe you're including water, who knows? And a $4 payment on your $70 mortgage. Pretty straightforward. Suddenly, family events happen. It's a little family business, and they shut down abruptly. Suddenly, you're co it's costing you five bucks a year, right? You still gotta pay the mortgage. You still gotta keep the water on. What are you gonna do? Well, you've met the first default trigger, right? Then, you're like, I just lost the tenant that makes my building more valuable than everyone else's. So my building is probably worth, at most, 70 bucks. And the other people, they've got tenants. I'm probably worth even less, because I got an empty building right now. So my mortgage is now underwater. I've now met both triggers of double trigger. So we're gonna take another vote. To default or not to default. How many people here would default on the mortgage at this point? Okay. Uh, half a dozen? How many people would not default? Maybe 30 and a lot of people not putting hands up? So here's a question. Not sure or I'm being unclear? Not sure. Okay. So what do people actually do? Well, tenants think about it this way. Or, I'm sorry, how landlords think about it. They go, well, maybe I'm just not going to get a tenant. Well, then I'm in trouble and I'm gonna to need to default or I'm gonna to have to come up with money outside, it's gonna be ugly. I could get an okay tenant, just like everybody else. If that's the case, I'll be making less money each month, but I'll still be getting a check each month. The mortgage will probably be kind of a wipe, right? My building's now worth 70, my mortgage is 70, I'm gonna have trouble refinancing it, but it'll probably be okay. But and I probably lost a little money while I was finding a tenant, but you know, a year or so, of income, I'll make up for that. What if I get another great tenant? I'm back, it's sunshine and roses. In reality, most landlords gamble on the second two, sometimes even for years looking for that next tenant. Nobody essentially defaults immediately. Well, why am I telling you a story of an inconsistent logical framework and I'm telling you this is a tragedy? This does not sound like a plausible tragedy. Well, the key is that double trigger is entirely accepted by academia. Everything in academia uses it. It assumes it, it starts from it, and dare you not question it. A student had done a great piece of modeling. They'd made reasonable assumptions, tested the validity, but he'd made an error, making the fewest additional assumptions. All of his work was based on his thesis advisor and a group of about half a dozen other academics who all of their work was built on double trigger. Because all the academics, and he, what, he, why shouldn't he? All the academics he knew used it. Everybody knew it was true. It, it's common sense, right? I put up that first one. It makes a lot of sense until you think through all the other options. But like putting a well but wooden box on top of a house of cards, it all kind of easily collapsed. 
I was doing a phone interview, and early in that phone call, before I understood really totally what the student had done, he said, oh, I did some work on double trigger default. I said, you know, that's really interesting, because um, you know, someone needs to do some nuances on that since it doesn't work. And he was like, um, what? I started talking to him about the data, and then as I talked to him more, it became clear what his thesis was. And um, at that point, I'm trying to, in some way, soften the blow, point out what's OK. The student was to say he was crushed would be going to make an understatement. He'd spent three years of his life writing a thesis. He had pride in that work. He had trusted his advisors. And suddenly, he learned that his advisors had ignored the data because it made a beautiful theory. His work doesn't have any applicability. It's just an exercise. And he was still going to get his PhD, but it was clear he felt bad about it. The world of getting caught onto layered previous assumptions is a, can be a dark one. And I'll keep remembering this, and it helps me remember to not make this mistake and help my students not make this mistake. So we're going to go back to academia. We're going to attempt to rethink it. Um, a little aside, I remember going to one of my first economics conferences. And I sat down with some grad students and postdocs. I thought, this would be just interesting. Let's hear about what they're doing. And I just chatted with them. And then as we were getting to the end of it, it was a break. And uh, we were getting to the end of snacking and drinking our coffee. And one of the guys was like, I was, said, like, Kyle, Kyle's committing academic suicide today. I was like, what? Like, and they're like, ah, yep, all over for you, Kyle. Like, what? Kyle's showing data. <laughs> Why would that be? Why would you don't think about that as a problem? Psychology uses data. Chemistry uses data. Why would economics not use data? We'll come back to that. Because there's an enormous amount of modeling work on economic bubbles. Scads of books, papers, complex work. There's a large amount of funding for it. The state of prediction, and even for that matter, understanding, is incredibly poor. I'll show how much this is a case of taking the easiest answer and the danger of poor external motivations. I'll show a simple approach that looks at simpler assumptions, fits with history, and gives us some insights that help us actually manage bubbles. And as an aside, I've actually given a more detailed talk on this to the central banks of Europe. Um, they've, they've had interest in this because in the end, a lot of them are pretty aware of this mess as people trying to actually apply things to make the economies of the world run a little better. So let's start by actually trying to define what we even mean by econ economic bubble. We have two slightly confusing and fancy definitions from NASDAQ or, or Investopedia. I think the academic one's the slightly funnier one because typically the academic definitions are circular. The best way to forward your theory about something is to define away the problem. Say you're from the University of Chicago. You're a free market economist who believes the economy can do real wrong. What is the definition of a bubble? It's a thing that people want to call a bubble because there's no such thing as bubbles because everything is efficiently priced always and pri values of things are always as they are up or down. Well, yeah, I mean, why do we really want to talk about that? Or you go to someone from Princeton, and they're like, it's a phenomenon in which evil people try and fool stupid people, and they try and fool other more stupid people, and it's a parade of fools that result in unnaturally high prices. Well, if I'm trying to prove that markets are infinitely efficient or that it's a greater fool theory, I can take care of that quick. But what people can agree on is the examples. Some of the most cited ones are here to the left. The South Seas bubble from 1720 is where the term comes from. And there are tons of examples. For me, I just tried to pick a basic definition, a significant price and pulses, prices that must necessarily fall. There's weaknesses to this. It's a little glib, but it's a lot more useful than the complex definitions. And I kind of poke here at Garber, who is actually kind of the key Chicago person who's pushed most bubbles are not real. Um, he has a really great book in which he goes through a lot of the classic data from bubbles. And he does this beautiful historical work. And he cleans up the data, and he shows you all this great stuff. And then, and then a miracle occurs. And his theory is true. 
So it's a tragic book to read, but if you stick with the history part, it's pretty cool. So let's talk about what makes an appealing explanation. Because that's what wins often in the marketplace of ideas. The first is people like a single, easy to understand cause and effect. People like simple answers, and academia respects theories when they cover more things. A single umbrella theory that covers everything is better than three or four or five separate ones. Supporting experiments. A cynical is going to be about some things. People believe things more when there's experiments showing that it's true, especially kinds that are repeatable, which are hard because the financial world is messy. In many cases, we're running one experiment. We don't get a control group. It's hard. Supporting economic theory and math. Seeing something that happens and lining it up, because you can't do that as well, building mathematical structures helps a lot. And then a controversial, inflammatory, or politically pandering explanation. That there's a deep human appeal and exciting answers. And pundits and experts are not rewarded for being right. There's a famous guy named Tetlock who used to be an obscure name I would toss out in these talks, but now some folks have run into him in Nate Silver's work. He's a sociologist who, when he got tenure, said, I'm using tenure for what it's for. I'm now going to run a 30-year experiment starting now. And what he did is he studied experts and what was correlated with them being right and what was related to success in their careers. Being right had nothing to do with success in careers because no one goes back and challenges pundits on whether they're right or not. Few people go back and challenge academics on if they're right or not. Many academics are horrible at predicting anything, but that's not what they're judged on. On the other hand, how do you get famous? You say big, exciting, inflammatory things that get you in front of a newspaper reporter on a national finance show. And making it even more extreme is economics is embroiled with politics. So an answer that sounds really Republican or really Democratic gets you all kinds of support. Oh, everyone should be listening to Edwin because his results are here on the political spectrum and therefore he's right. In the end, the literature of economic bubbles is full of oversimplified, politically pandering ideas. There's another thought from Tetlock's work that has become, again, I think probably the biggest popularizing it recently has been by Nate Silver, though I actually ran into it in an article in a Newsweek decades ago by a uh, New York newspaper reporter named Sharon Begley. And it's this idea of the hedgehog and the fox. And it comes from an ancient Greek warrior poet who said the fox knows many things but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Hedgehogs build a structure, they fit things in, and they understand it holistically. Foxes know lots of individual things and solve it in pieces. We love hedgehog theories. Politics and academia love hedgehog theories. Hedgehogs are much, much less good at predicting things than foxes. Most theories are pe that work are piecemeal and messy, because the world is piecemeal and messy. So what kind of answer am I going to give you about bubbles? I'm going to give you one. Does it, does it have a single easy to understand cause effect relationship? No. No, it definitely doesn't. Does it have ex supporting experiments? Actually, it does. It's one where we can do some. What about supporting mathematical economic theory? In the end, I'm going to give you a fox answer, or a little uh, the, the surface of one given time today. And only in one of the cases is there any solid math. Turns out it's a very useful case, but the others, no. Nope. What about a controversial, inflammatory, or politically pandering answer? The answer will make no one in those camps happy. Um, so I spent four years helping regulators after the crisis get to a better understanding how to take apart companies. And, I, and as part of that, I used to teach their, employees question, teach their employees classes on a regular basis. And I used to go into each of them and I would say, I am an equal opportunity offender. Whichever tribe you belong to, and let's be clear, they're a tribe, Democrat or Republican, your economic theory is bunk. It does not line up well with facts, and I'm going to offend you by showing you facts. So the way I'm typically inflammatory is by not being appropriately pandering for whatever audience. So one of the things I'm going to point out is that the, what I'm going to line up do is definitely a fox answer, which hopefully is a good sign. And in the end, trading the financial markets is akin to good experimental science. 
It allows you to test things in all sorts of interesting ways. To do that, I first said, I kind of not sure I believe this, all bubbles are the same phenomenon. But what if bubbles are like a fever? I know there's a fever, but saying like, I'm now going to model all disease by saying there's a single thing called the fever. In the end, fevers are outcomes of lots of underlying causes. In the end, if you don't think about the underlying causes, you don't get it right. So I start asking questions, just really basic history ones, to characterize and structure the problem. I asked, was a dominant player role played by leverage? It's basically borrowing or overprinting of currency. Was a dominant role played by fraud in the bubble? And as a note, that's a dominant role. Bubbles attract fraud, even when they, so there's usually some around the edge. Was the boom kicked off by technology? Was picking individual assets important? So in other words, did some things win and some things lose, instead of everything seeming to win and then everything seeming to lose? Was a large role played by a human tendency to assume that when prices are going up, they're going to keep going up? And finally, were meaningful things of value left behind? And you may be going, what? Economic bubbles leaving value behind? I'm going to touch on a couple, but what about the internet bubble? We get anything out of the internet bubble? Yeah. We got all sorts of interesting companies, new services. Was it a mess at the time? Yeah, but value was left behind. We could ask a lot of other questions. What I did is I, this is part of a much larger spreadsheet. I made a list of bubbles. And then I just started checking the boxes. Just read a lot of history. And I went, okay, you find that momentum plays a role in all of them. Dominant role of fraud only in a few. I know a lot of people think of the subprime and the larger bubble as having a large role of fraud. Fraud makes good newspaper and television. But in the end, it was mostly around the edges. It had a lot more to do with the leverage one. So I tried to say the leverage. What about a dominant role of tech change? And I looked at these check marks for a little bit. And I said, this doesn't look like one phenomenon. It looks like three with an exception. So there are fraud-based bubbles ones in red. It is perhaps should make us feel good the last major fraud bubble was before the Great Depression in the 1920s. Have you ever heard the phrase, want to buy some swampland in Florida? Anybody hear that? That's from that. It's hard to travel. There's no internet. A lot of parts of Florida were hard to get to. There was a boom happening there. People would buy and sell Florida real estate sight unseen, and sometimes it was literally water. And in the end, there's a longer story here we don't have time for, but the bubble lasted until somebody took an already old schooner and accidentally wrecked it in the Miami Harbor. Weird things end bubbles. We also have leverage bubbles. The dot-com bubble is, a, is one that we all know well. But for that matter, um, Black Tuesday at the Great Depression and for that matter, the experience of the Japanese, all based on that. And then tech bubbles. There have been a lot of them. Anyone who tells you this time is different, you should basically start not trusting them. Um, most of these things have happened lots of times before. And in fact, if I were to tell you the story of the auto bubble in the US, you'd think it would sound like Silicon Valley, a town where all the talent suddenly goes, Detroit. And as people gather there, thousands of small companies start fighting over what's clearly going to be a meaningful market. There's a melee, there's a boom and bust as thousands of the thousands fail, are absorbed, and in the end, a few dozen companies come out the other side, eventually winnowing down to the eight that the early modern era saw. Same things happening over and over. So I said, okay, what if there are three things I need to model here? I have now lost any plausibility in academia because I'm not going to give you one theory. I'm going to suggest that there are three. And I'm going to tell you modeling fraud, modeling behavior of fraud and detecting it is its own fun thing. And we could have a lot of fun talking about Bedford's Law and other exciting stuff like that. But it's really hard to do because the point of fraud is to go in a direction people haven't anticipated before. Tech bubbles. There are some things we can understand, but as we'll touch on, tech bubbles are weird. And in the end, by the time you're trying, you can understand them often in hindsight, but trying to predict them ahead of time is what gets people in trouble. Leverage bubbles, once you isolate them, are the place where you actually can do some meaningful modeling. 
What? Just a there we go. So fraud bubbles. Um, there's a famous author, Kindleberger, who has one of the best books on, on uh, bubbles. And the reason why is because he doesn't try and put any theories. He just writes about every bubble in the world. But he points out that when everyone else is getting rich, or you think they are, it's easier to believe someone's implausible pitch to you. If someone comes to you and say, I can double your money in a month, you're like, okay, clearly, clearly someone trying to rip me off. But when two of your neighbors just said, hey, I just doubled my money in a month, and someone comes, you want to go tumble your money in a month? Sounds real different. And in some bubbles, fraud was definitely the dominant effect. And for regulators, the real lesson here is about vigilance. And when it really comes down to it, not saying they shouldn't keep working, but they've done a pretty good job. It's important to note about how smaller frauds proliferate around both other kinds of bubbles and larger frauds. There's a classic work that outlies some things about the South Seas bubble, the one that gave bubbles its name. And people started stock companies then for things like a wheel for perpetual motion, um, for employing poor artificers and furnishing merchants and others with watches, for the transmutation of quicksilver into malleable fine metal. Now, there was, you have to be careful about your own lens on things. One of the items in that list often scoffed at was an exchange market for human hair. But how many people wore, wore wigs made of hair bought from poor people that grew it out and cut it off? Lots. It actually was a good idea, but it sounds dumb through our modern lens. Leverage bubbles. Increase in the supply of credit, how many loans people can get, increase in money. They involve a cycle of asset prices go up a little bit for some natural, maybe good reason, which in turn, People go, hey, this is going to keep going probably. So they decide they're willing to pay even more. It feeds on itself. And the longer it goes up, the more people are like, well, this is just the new normal. Everything's different now. They're going to keep going up. This is the new trajectory. So people go up even further. And then eventually, something cracks it. Great Depression, Great Recession. Leverage bubbles are typically the ones that hurt human well-being the most. One of the interesting things, and it kind of comes from, it started from kind of the money supply leverage bubble in, is there's some great experimental work. Um, one of the kind of interesting bits of my career was getting to actually meet the guys who won the Nobel Prize for their experimental work. And they've done tons of controlled experiments. And I don't have time today to go through all of it, but they've done a fascinating series of experiments and now so many other people leveraged off of it, relaxing different assumptions. So we set up a fake marketplace. Well, the problem is it's a fake marketplace. Well, let's do some experiments where it involves lots of real money. Well, the problem is, is that you make the experiment too short. Let's run totally huge ranges of links to the experiment and look at how the answer varies over time. The problem is that everyone is weird. You guys heard that term? Western, educated, uh, industrial. It's a flaw with most social science studies. They basically are all using college students. So they said, what if we use people from all over the world at different income levels? Results all have held. And what they've tended to show is that bubbles are a natural human phenomenon. We tend to create them in the absence of anything else because we like momentum. There are only a few things that allow you to change bubbles. The leverage of money supply, the experience of the traders. What's interesting is if everyone's a neophyte or everyone's experienced, bubbles. Or, uh, 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 sorry, or some people are experienced, some aren't, bubbles. It is interesting if, actually I misstated it, if everyone is experienced, bubbles are much, much smaller. Because there's a, definitely an element of greater fool to bubbles. I have to have someone who I think is kind of stupid who's going to buy the thing when it's definitely gotten too high. So if I know everyone else playing the game is really good at this, I, I'm going to be a lot more careful. And certain types of futures markets. There are weird ways you can kind of almost, regardless of the length of the experiment, arbitrage, if they would say, away the entire rest of the game. What about tech dominant bubbles? Um, normally there's a big change, and the important thing is tech bubbles are often driven by equity. They're not, about, they're not about loans, they're not about bonds, they're about investing in ownership in companies. But because investors are rational, weird crud can happen. Very weird things. Another basic, there are two basic economic theories that you should just know going out of here. Do not work at all. The first is almost all economic theory after a 101 course, 
assumes that money essentially flows like a fluid. It goes where it needs to be, it expands to fit, it is frictionless. This is bunk. Another thing it assumes is that market prices give you an idea of fair value. This is also bunk. Well, in the second one, you might go, hold on a minute. Isn't it the fair value? Let's ask a question. So I'm going to pick a real-world asset. It's a major piece of infrastructure in the US. And it went up for sale because it had tolls associated with it. What were the bids for it? I eventually got my hands on them. One, $450 million. The next, $500 million. The next, $700 million. The winning bid, $2 billion. What do you think the fair market price was? It didn't take much to show that $2 billion, this is one of the two times I essentially ended up as a whistleblower in the system. Something funny was happening. But even the person who bid 700 was well above everyone else. And in fact, I'm almost certain the mistake they were making, making them think it was worth more. Things are bought by the person who loves them most. And they almost certainly are bidding too high. And that creates weird effects. Think about a tech bubble. Imagine there's some new technology that's going to create 1,000 bucks of value. New companies arise, we'll assume 100 of them. And maybe we think 10 of them are survived. So those 10 companies, let's say they get 100 bucks each when everything ends. As an investor, I'm looking at all these different companies, and I'm like, OK, they're only going to unlock $1,000 of value. Say there are 100 companies that get funding. They should, on average, be worth $10 each. But the problem is that each person buying a company believes it's going to be one of the 10 winners. And they're like, why should I only pay 10 bucks and buy some of this company? I'm going to bid up and get more of this company. I'm going to pay 30 bucks. I'm still going to more than triple my money when I suddenly get 100. So everyone thinks they have the winner when they bid, so what's funny is an index of these companies would be at 3,000. Everyone has acted rationally. Everyone has made reasonable guesses. And the market is triple overvalued. This is the standard pattern of equity bubbles. I'm going to skip this one just given time. But a couple of ones that's worth noting. Uh, UK railway mania makes some good reading. There's actually. Uh, if you think the dot-com bubble was big, imagine a bubble that gets to 8% of the economy. And in fact, it had such a set of weird events that so discredited its regulators that things almost fell apart. The dot-com bubble is an interesting one because we think we know what happened. It's studied tons. Lots of people like to study where data is available. It's a recent bubble. Therefore, it gets lots of study, and people act like it's every other bubble. It's amazing. People who are part of the greater fool camp love to only use the dot-com bubble and nothing else. Now, the greater fool part is that tech bubbles have a general phenomenon. If you've heard of it, you're going to lose money investing in it. All the money is made by people early on before it's publicly known. Normally, by the time you launch off into valuations that are never going to be sustained, that's about when you're hearing about it on the financial news or from your neighbor. Though it's interesting, the tech bubble, Greenspan got out in front of it and called it overvalued at a point where it actually wasn't yet. So it was interesting. This one has a little bit of exception. I'm going to have to touch on, as I get to the end, tulip mania. I won't get to fully explain it, but it's the weird bubble. And yet, it's the one everyone likes to write about. And it's the only one that doesn't fit any pattern because it's not a tech bubble. It's not a leverage bubble. It's not a fraud bubble. In fact, if you look into it, it was a fashion bubble. Tulips, the patterns are unique and associated with viruses. You can't breed them, the fancy tulips. These are not the single color tulips you can go buy at Whole Foods. These are crazy patterned, beautiful things. And they were caused by viruses. So the only way to replicate a beautiful tulip was essentially to clone it by splitting off the bulb. Owning the bulb of a variety was essentially owning the factory for a, or a fashion item. Turns out also, the stories of people paid the many years of salary to buy one bulb. No, they didn't. They paid a tiny percentage up front, and it was a fully cancelable contract. They paid a tiny fraction of that, and they were like, I'm going to watch, in particular, the French fashion market. And if this becomes big, I'm going to go ahead and pay the money, because I'm going to make big money on this. And if it looks like it's not, I just won't pay any more money. So they essentially, as you might say, bought an option on a fashion item. It was very, very strange. 
And it doesn't fit anything we've had since, but it doesn't stop people from liking to write about it, and in some way the attention on it distracts us from the answers that matter more. I can make a little side trip as I reach the end. Mathematics I found useful. In a career of doing mathematical modeling, the short answer is all of it. And the most extreme case I can say is I once used the first fundamental theorem of calculus to help a pulp and paper plant save, save several million dollars a year. It's all useful if you're going to go into mathematics. There are things outside of basic arithmetic and geometry that have been the most useful and impactful in this order. Stats, probability and combinatorics, linear algebra, and the basics of calculus, the idea of areas under curves, slopes, et cetera. There are some things that I have to highlight that people grossly misuse constantly. Game theory. Single play games versus repeat games. Everyone loves the answers from single play games. Almost everything's a repeat game. Chaos theory, good excuse for acting like we know nothing, but actually if leveraged right, allows us to know some fascinating stuff. And most big data techniques, because most people's data is terrible. And in the end, big data techniques act like data is pristine and often gives us enormous rounds of false knowledge and bogus garbage. Now there's an important thing there are things that aren't on this list. There are lots of other things we learn that are important. And I want to make a really important distinction. I'm a believer that there's a big, when you learn something, it changes the sa scaffolding in your mind. These are the techniques I used, but that's different from what things helped grow the the, that scaffolding in my mind to think about other problems. And I think that that's a critical thing. So some closing thoughts. The most important thing I've learned from my math modeling class was things about the problem solving process and how to think about assumptions. In the end, they will probably forget most of the mathematical techniques you teach them. But hopefully you'll build a scaffolding, and if you teach them problem solving techniques, they'll probably use that no matter where their life takes them. The spirit of Occam's razor is really about trustworthy data and strong assumptions, and avoiding strong assumptions. And to do that, they have to understand how to test that, how to work with that. And that's something that's normally not taught, but more useful than probably any individual thing about conic sections. The razor is typically misapplied a lot of ways, and you should be ready to spot it and help them spot it, seeking the easy answer and trusting too many other assumptions. Economic bubbles, it's pretty troubled. People use overly complex structures that are hard to use and understand, even if they can mathematically be proven to be equivalent and rigorous. And Poor academic footing has been encouraged by poor incentives for experts to be inflammatory rather than right. And one of the things I think is interesting is that relatively simple framings have allowed me to actually predict things about bubbles that really have not taken that hard of math. But what it took was looking at a problem that everyone had a lot of accepted answers, they were entrenched camps, and just take a fresh look at it. And I can't help but wonder how many other age-old problems that we act like are messy and hard just require a fresh look, require new framing. And I'm hoping that the next generation of mark, uh, modelers can be better armed to go find those and that the folks in this room will help prepare them. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>